the biggest problem with, I think, a lot of businesses is they don't know what they don't know. And so they guess it or they think they know it or they think they can build it. Sure. And they usually make a mistake in that process. Hello, and welcome to Sink or Swim, a weekly podcast brought to you by RentSync, where we take a deep dive into the prop tech, multifamily, and rental housing industry. In each episode, we uncover the technologies and strategies used to help overcome operational challenges and increase the value of your multifamily investments. So let's get into our conversation today. Welcome back to Sink or Swim. I'm your host, Nicolina Savelli. And on this podcast, I chat with multifamily and prop tech experts to learn how you can reach more renters, sign more leases, and maximize the value of your assets. And today, I have Simon Baker, who has over a 20-year career in online marketplaces, from being CEO of the REA Group through advising market leaders around the world and investing in 30-plus marketplaces in 15 countries. He is currently the chair of CAV Investment Group and the Australian Stock Exchange listed PropTech Group Limited. He is co-chair of the NASDAQ SPAC Genesis Growth Tech Acquisition Corp and a board member of the NYSE listed CIAN. He was previously the chair of ASX listed Real Estate Envistar Limited and Metula Group Limited. I mean, the list really goes on and on, and that, that was a mouthful, and I've had a lot of guests on the show, but that definitely was the longest list of experiences <laughs> I've ever had to say. So I'll stop there and first say, Simon, thank you so much for joining me today. And, you know, I'd really like to have you share how you got involved in online marketplaces and why you're so passionate about this vertical, because clearly you are. <laughs> <laughs> Nicolina, thank you very much for having me. Okay, how I got involved was quite funny. Back in 2000, so way, way back, okay. a very long time, 20, 22 years ago now, I was working at News Corp in Australia and I was heading up their online strategy. I did the deal for them to acquire a very, very small company called realestate.com.au. They invested all of uh, $2.25 million and some marketing and bought 44% of this company that was listed at that time on the stock exchange. And I, I was sort of intrigued because I did the deal. I had to, I, I, was, I had to market it to uh, Lock and Murdoch, get him to say yes, and so on. And then, having done that, I then went to the the the, to the listed company to the chairman and said, "I think I could run this company better than the guy who's currently running it." <laughs> they gave me the keys to the car, so to speak. Wow! This is a property portal, so I got to I got to run it. And then, over the next eight years, we took the business from having around 4 million in revenue to 135 million. We went from loss making to profitable and we took it from a market cap of $8 million to a billion dollars. And, and in, that, in, in that process, you learn a lot about what makes these businesses work. And, you un, and, and we, we acquired businesses in England, in Italy, in uh, the UAE, Hong Kong, and a couple other places I can't remember now. Okay, and so we, we expanded greatly. I then left and then thought, well, after eight years of doing this, and I love what I'm doing, I just want to keep doing it. So I then started to invest in these businesses, advise them. I joined boards. I was on the, the, the chairman of a, com- a listed company called the iProperty Group and so on. And so through that journey, you get to learn a lot about these companies. Now, what's interesting is that REA Group today is worth $25 billion. It's a, it's a massive company. It owns Realtor.com, for example. Okay, US. I was going to ask, is it associated with Realtor.com oh, yeah. no, in the it's, US? It's, yes, it's, yeah, absolutely, because it's News Corp. Okay. Right? Same company, and, 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 and the REA Group owns, I think, 25% of it, maybe more, I'm not sure. And they own market leaders in, in, in many countries now. So it's a big player and it's doing very, very well. So that's how I got involved in this industry. Right. And now this isn't part of my questions, but I'm going to continue to go off script because I think you, that you'll be fine with me asking things that are off script. But basically, uh, what were kind of the, what would you say were maybe the early lessons or maybe the biggest lessons that you learned in order to kind of drive that company forward? I mean, at the time, I'm sure there wasn't really a, a playbook for you to to go by as it was probably pretty innovative at the time. So was there anything that you can share that was kind of like, oh, yeah, this yeah. is what I need to do? Yeah. Yeah. So so when you break it down, so my, my background was I spent five years with McKinsey and Company and Consulting. So I'd seen a lot of different businesses. And what I did was I took the lessons I learned 
from those businesses and apply them to this what would have in those days was 20 odd people and a, and, and really the startup culture mm -hmm. and the, the main lessons are around one is focus it's very as you grow it's very easy to get distracted by bright shiny lights you know these new opportunities everywhere but until you've got so much penetration to your core business and that you're really a market leader don't get distracted by them just focus on what you're doing and execute and then work on executional excellence and that's what we did we had it actually i keep saying we we the, to people ask me this question is it got very boring for about three years as we just went around signing up real estate agents with advertising packages banging on doors and you sign with us the second i think is persistence so you got to find problems every day it's it's how you address those problems okay and it's and sometimes people get oh my god this is so big what am i going to do and then sometimes like no okay let's break it down into little bits and see if we can solve each little bit and then we'll get over that hump and then we can keep accelerating i think the third lesson that i learned out of it is is you got to manage your shareholders stakeholders not just shareholders but stakeholders very carefully it's around communication setting expectations not and, and when you set expectations, try to at least get there or even overachieve them. But right. there's no use saying, I'm going to do, do a billion and you're coming to 800,000. I'm like, come on. Right? Of course. You know, there's, there's a gap. Of course. And, and I think the last thing is trust in the people around you. Select great people and then trust in them. So, so we used to have you know, various uh, mantras that we would talk about in the business. Everything from just get on with it, right? It's not your job. <laughs> it's not my job to go, yes, do it. It's like, I trust you to do it get on and do it now i don't expect you to get 100 percent right maybe seven out of ten correct decisions would be good as long as the three that you get it wrong aren't really bad of course right yeah so i think yeah. that is and the other one is don't let perfection get in the way of better okay yeah i think that's a huge business for any startup i've worked for the last 12 years i've worked in startup culture and that really is something that has always either driven things forward or held people back because yes. they're all they're looking for perfection, they're looking to get and the thing is you have an opportunity when you're a startup to make mistakes and not that many people are going to notice unless and and you can pivot quickly. So when you make those mistakes, you can kind of learn very quickly and make the changes that you need to make without anyone really holding you overly accountable when you're not a public company. Yes. But yes, I think that the the need for perfection is just at the end of the day, you may be wasting time on just not learning when you're trying to achieve perfection. When you learn, you can ultimately achieve what you may think is perfection, but at least it will drive the business forward to a degree. So I think that that's a, a super valuable lesson to learn at the early stages of any any company and probably any rental listing site that's out there right now um, that might be listening, because I know a we have a lot of listeners who are actual online marketplaces and owners and founders of online marketplaces. So kind of moving on from that, and you talked about the lessons and kind of what you learned, what venture would you say was the most challenging for you in online marketplaces? What were kind of the maybe the challenges, failures uh, that you you learned and what helped you set up so many of these marketplaces for success, which you kind of already said, but if you could say maybe the most challenging for you. There have been many challenging ones for very, very different reasons. So, so I, I probably can't think of the most challenging, but I'll tell you a quick story about a challenging one and, and what they did to, to succeed. So I was a very early investor in a company called Viva Real, which was a property portal in Brazil. And it was set up by a guy called Brian Requa, who's a, an American, but he was living in um, Colombia at that point. And the first challenge was, and I got involved and I did add an investment. And, and as Brian said, he knocked on about 30 or 40 different doors trying to get people to invest. And I was the, the guy who said yes first, <laughs> which turned out to be a good thing in the end. But at that time, I had no idea. So I took a punt. I liked the guy. I thought he was smart. I thought he had a, a good idea of what he wanted to do. But the first challenge that they faced was about direction. They were they were uh, in Colombia. They had the site in in Brazil and in Mexico, and they were they were doing a whole range of things. And so the first thing was about focus. The point I made earlier, right? And so we got them to focus. And I remember with them, and we wrote on the board one day, A A B, all about Brazil. Why? Because it's massive, and there's a lot of opportunity. And the players who were there at that point in time were not very innovative. 
they were very more corporate in their approach. So they, they, they pivoted. We talked about pivoting before, you know, not letting perfection get in the way better. They pivoted, focused on Brazil. He moved to Brazil. He got all the team to focus on them. And they grew rapidly. Okay. And over the next probably four years, so this was back 2008, 2009, this happened. And then about the next four or five years, they worked through various hurdles of growing mm -hmm. the business. Mm -hmm. And then they became equal market leaders. So then they faced the next hurdle. What do I do now? Okay. And the next hurdle was how do I convince the other guy to merge? Because if you take market leader A, equal market leader B, put them together, you get a much bigger company. And that market leader was called Zap, Zap Immobase, right? After a lot of negotiations, which they did not make, they merged and created Grupo Zap. Okay? And they ended up with roughly 50 odd percent each. One got a bit more, a little bit less. And they, with Grupo Zap, which is a large media company in, uh, in Globo, sorry, it was a large media company in Brazil as the other shareholder. And that, that then created a whole bunch of new problems is how do you bring two different companies together, different cultures, different work ethics, different approaches to the market, different, just everything was completely different. And then I spent another chunk of time with them, hands on everything from sales to marketing to product, just really working through how do you bring these together in a way that is going to create value for the visitor to the portal and the agent or the advertiser right. on the portal. Right. They, they went through the process of, of merging and growing and, and, and after about two or, two or three years of going around in circles sometimes, but they eventually yeah. got this, this huge leadership position over the, what was now a number, different number two player. And then they faced another hurdle is OLX, the large multinational classifieds player, said, well, we want to buy you. And so then how do you negotiate a deal with OLX where you maximize the value for everyone involved okay in a market where the brazilian real is decreasing in value versus the us dollar and your shareholders are in the us okay yeah and there's there's all the political nuances and so on so that was a, that's an interesting story of hurdles and how you overcome them and and at the core of all of this was focus was having a strong leader so brian and and lucas who was the ceo at that point brian was the chairman very good leaders, very strong, very clear on what they're trying to do. They articulated it well to all parties, stakeholders, all stakeholders, the employees, the shareholders, and so on. And they end up with a very good outcome for everyone. So I think there's some very strong lessons learned in how you overcome these sort of hurdles. Is there a skill that you notice or you've experienced in your investing career as leaders that you think that you look for? And you make sure that the leaders kind of possess before you get invested or yep. get involved. Can you share kind of what that what that skill is? <laughs> yeah, I call them characteristics more than skills. Sure, that's fair. And and these characteristics probably fit into to a number of categories. The first is clarity in what they're trying to do. I mean, they've really got to pass the elevator test. Yeah, get in, and you've got to. I understand the industry. I've I've seen so many of these models. It's crazy. You should be able to say. I'm doing X, Y, or Z, and this is how I'm going to make money. Here's my target audience. And by the way, thanks for the 15 second elevator ride or the 30 second elevator ride. Because it's not, these aren't complex businesses. It's about how you execute. The second thing I look for is determination. Okay. So sometimes I just won't return their calls and I want to see how often they chase me down. Do, are they persistent? Okay. You've asked me for money. You've asked me for help, but do you actually follow up? Okay. Or are you just there to get the check and then disappear? Of course. Okay. The third is realistic valuations and projections, okay? I'm not an idiot. I know what a hockey <laughs> stick looks like. I know what's plausible, okay? I'll get it. I won't get it right, I'll, I, but I, 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 I can sniff what's overly enthusiastic, mm -hmm. okay? Okay. Yeah, loss-making, 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 massive profit, year four. Just invest today. Oh, come on. It never works out. Yeah, way. okay. Okay. And then, and the last thing is they've got to pass the beer test. Okay. Okay. The beer test is I've got to be able to have a beer with them. Okay. That's, the, it meant literally what you, what it, what yeah, it said. It, it, <laughs> it literally means the same thing. It means I've got to be able to sit down with them over a beer and just chat. The, the re, the, but there's a reason behind this, right? The, the, the reason is, are they, are they, are they, are they there just for an outcome or are they there to, to actually, learn and develop 
Because if, if over that beer you're having a conversation, you want to see how, you know, what sort of questions, are they personable? Do they care anything about you as a person? Okay, because if they don't care about me as a person, they're going to care about their employee in that process. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's a it's an indication of what the, the, the culture they're running as well, right? If, yeah. they, if they don't care about people, if they don't show empathy. Exactly. And, and, and if I look back at my successful investments and my absolute disaster investments where I've written off money, and there's been a few, the ones that have written off money have one thing in common is I couldn't stand the guy <laughs> or good. I just couldn't stand in hindsight. That's fair. And, and, and I invested for the wrong reasons. So in hindsight, yeah, you've got to pass the beer test. Yeah. So there needs to be a relationship. There needs to be something there, a connection that kind of pulls you both into saying you want this to be mutually successful yes. and not one-sided. Yes. Absolutely. Now, is there any of those failures that in the online marketplaces, you said that it was because you know you didn't really like them. Is there anything in their business that were like very not in line with what? Was there anything that you you can share that might be like you know what that was a bad business? Oh yeah, move and and you know this is kind of what led to maybe n- not getting your money back. <laughs> yeah, oh, I didn't get my money back. I didn't get a cent back on a few of them. Yeah, the the when, when I and 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 I I'm looking not at one in particular, but but in in general, the the the. the not the not passing the beer test, you know, not standing the guys, is, is an indicator of how they make decisions internally. And when you boil it all down, they're often making incorrect decisions internally. When you looked at why they failed, well, they overinvested in marketing, for example, too early. They underinvested in product. Maybe their product was fantastic, but they didn't have didn't invest in sales and marketing. Right? Often, you know, tech guys love beautiful products, but you know, that marketing and sales thing, okay. And sales and marketing leaders, they go, oh, I don't care about the product or whatever. It just, it just works, right? But they then don't there check There needs to happening. be a fine balance. Yeah. You've got to have that, that, that skill set that, that transitions, or, 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 yeah, transitions from product, ideas, fit for market, can we build it, is it going to be good, right through to are we communicating and supporting the product? Having 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 done the sale, absolutely. And when I look back, as the, the 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 beer test failing people are the ones who were very caught up in their own world about what's the way to do it. And that's not saying I had a better answer. I don't have better answers. I have an answer. I have a perspective, right? But the whole point is, if you're and, and I'll go back to this Brian Reckworth who who did Viva Real, he would ask twenty people for their opinions on how to do something. There you go. Yeah. Right. Because he's trying to triangulate in, am I doing the best? What works? What doesn't work? And he's taking that knowledge set to help him project his business forward. So I think that's when I, when I, when I think about it. So I like to have a beer with Brian and some of these other guys. In hindsight, if I'd followed my gut instinct up front, which sometimes I didn't do, I do better nowadays, I, I would not have made the investment. But yeah, you win some, you lose. Hopefully, you win more than you lose in this whole <laughs> sure. process, and you get to enjoy the journey. At the end of the day, we, we're all going in one one place, right? <laughs> that's guaranteed. But it's so it's, it's about enjoying the journey with these guys as well. Absolutely. And I, I've got to say, I've made some very good friends from the investments, and and they call. I said, "Hey, Simon, do you, what's your view on X?" And I say, "I don't know," or but I do know someone who may be able to help you. Sure. Right. Sure. Talk to someone else. Right. This other guy, and then I'll just do the intro. Let them talk. Right? And that's what it's all about. People who reach out, who want to learn, I think is a good indicator of someone who's got a much better chance of success than someone who's you know, caught up in their own world and, and own view of what's, what's right and what's wrong. Right. No, absolutely. Now, has there been any regret or missed opportunities in investing in online marketplaces? Any? No? Or you've, do, you've done all the good ones? Thousands. thousands of thousands, thousands. Okay. There's of course there's, there's always hindsight is wonderful. Of course, of course. I mean, we're, we're all we're, we're we're all massively successful in hindsight. It's foresight that is the most important one, and and that's where it's hard. Of course, yes. And I mean, I'm sure, yeah, you can count count the list of of missed opportunities. But I think that goes for that goes for any vertical, any industry. Oh, there's no. always there's always opportunities there, and you just kind of have to take what comes and and you can only take on so much sometimes right so yeah (laughs) now obviously rental listing sites are a super competitive space if you were giving advice to someone who owned operated a rental listing site right now what would you tell them 
they need to do to kind of future proof themselves and kind of ensure profitability because a lot of these rental listing sites are getting, and I had this conversation in my last episode, that they are getting this bad rep of being antiquated. And even though that people need them, they're not really progressing. So what would you kind of tell tell someone in this space to to kind of look forward and, and make sure that they're future-proofing this, this kind of channel? Like what you hear so far? Make sure you never miss an episode by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. The way I view this, if you're a listing site, you are part of yesterday, okay? You have to be focused on the transaction. And the transaction in rentals is I have someone who wants to rent something at its core, right? And they're going to rent it for a day, a week, a month, a year, whatever, a period of time. And my job as the matchmaker is to ensure that the renter is a bona fide person. They've got the money. They're not going to do any damage. You know, they've got a job, whatever. And at the other end mm-hmm. is that what they're renting is also bona fide, right? Is that it is a legitimate property. It's well-maintained. Whatever the, the landlord is promising, you know, whether it's, whether it's furnished, unfurnished, whatever, is true. Okay. And my job is to make that transaction of bringing these two together to be super smooth, super fast, risk free for both parties. Now, if I can deliver that, okay, I'm changing the way the industry works. Okay. So I'm not just a search engine. That's just the starting point. Here's a property. Oh, I like that property. Click, apply. How do I apply? Fill out this form. Click. Then automated credit checks, automated tenant checks are done for whatever that tenant looks at, right? Or it should be all AI driven, tick, done, perfect. You are suitable. At the other end, oh, I'm putting on a new property. I need some mechanism to make sure, you know, the landlord hasn't got any issues. There's not someone who's going to demolish the place. There's <laughs> no road, road works occurring out the front for the next six months or whatever. Okay. I've got to make sure that I am renting what I'm, what I'm, you know, I have making available with it. And then I've just got to match the two together. Here are some contracts. I'm trying to move in. Thanks very much. Oh, by the way, I want to de-risk this. So you as the landlord, you can have uh, renter's insurance. Sure. Or something. Yep. Right? Bang, bang, bang. And you as the, the, the tenant, well, you don't want to put three months worth of rent into some escrow account or whatever. No. So here is a, a deposit bond or deposit product. So reducing the any scams and anything that could yeah. come from that transaction. But it's also reducing the tensions. Oh, I've got to find three months of money to put aside. And how do I know that I'm going to get it all back anyway? So there's all these services you can put around it that smooth the transaction and it can all be automated. And that to me is the future. If you can do that. If you're in a listing site that maybe you know, didn't doesn't have those things. So integrations is probably what you're looking at, or at least acquisitions of some kind in order to provide those kind of, or building it yourself, which can take a lot of time. But because I know a lot of rental listing sites have operated as more search engine focused. So if you don't have that in order to to really catch up and ensure that people can trust you, then I, th- I think that that's, that's probably what you're kind of looking for. I think that's why some of the rental listing sites that we that used to be like we had this conversation, I had this conversation last time, like Craigslist, it was seen initially as something that could be used as rental listings, but then the amount of scams that got brought into that, that it now created the, the need for actual formalized rental housing sites that actually were controlled and monitored and not just this avenue for scams and poor transactions and anonymous interactions because the anon- anonymous part of it made people be able to do whatever they wanted, obviously. Yeah, that's and that's the role. The role of the, the intermediary is to certify everything. And that's where blockchain technology steps in. That's where you know, all the learnings around, you know, every, everyone is identified in the process. So you can't get away with, oh, I'll put a fake listing up and I'll just get someone to send me some money to get a key to go look at a place that doesn't exist or, you know, all the scams that people do. And so you've got to just think of what are the ways. So, so then how do you do it? 
because which was the the, the 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 question i guess and 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 really that comes down to understand what you're strong at okay you're strong at uh, getting an audience and you're strong at getting listings fantastic and you're strong at marketing and generating leads excellent what are you weak at well i'm not very good at building up this or i don't have it okay so then partnering i would partner with the view of buying i would avoid building because that usually ends mm-hmm. up being the world's biggest project that lasts far longer uh-huh. than uh, than you ever ever dreamt of and i'm knee deep in this actual problem at the moment with with one of my investments it's called the proptech group in australia and we own 43% or so of all sales crm systems and we're rolling out property management crm systems as a plug, as a as a module so it's not a separate bit, separate system you just put it together but then the next question is okay how do i then take that as an underlying system and then automate so now we're partnering with people to learn as much about what we don't know as about what we do know because it's it's the the biggest problem with i think a lot of businesses is they don't know what they don't know and so they guess it or they think they know it or they think they can build it sure and they usually make a mistake in that process so just go i don't know right and i've got to find out mm-hmm. just admit it just let the ego yeah. slide and just admit you don't know and get yeah. the people who do <laughs> Agree. And then just bring them in, partner with them initially because you don't know until you've plugged and played with your system. So if, you, if you're, if you're a, a, prop, a, a rental portal at the moment and you want to offer tenant screening, find someone who does tenant screening, plug and play them in, see if it works. And then you go, you know what, this is working really well. I want an option to buy your business. I'll roll you in. There's equity. There's some sort of upside because what everyone wants to get to is scale of their business, right? You want to have large scale Absolutely. large revenues so then you can make mistakes and you can get away with it. Totally. Okay, so now obviously you've worked with listing sites across multiple countries, even continents. Do any stand out to you in terms of their business model and kind of what they're doing right now? Many do, for, but for very different reasons. So so I've worked with businesses from literally taking the globe, Peru, you know, distinct from Peru, US, Canada, one site and go around the world and and I've I've probably touched 40 or 50 different countries along the way until you get to Australia at the other end. Now, that includes everything from Japan through to, to Russia, through to either Ukraine, which is an interesting combination at the moment that I've got one of my businesses is dealing with, r- right through to, to Latin America and Southeast Asia. And the ones that do interesting stuff, the ones that go, oh, that's interesting. I, I, I sort of watch them. From a rental perspective, they're like Quinto and Da, which is out of Brazil. They're very good players in the, in the, the, the rental space. And they've aggressively gone after a segment of the market in Brazil that is unique. There's a site called Morado Uno, which I've invested in. So disclosure here, right? In Mexico, and they're trying to solve the same issue. Is how do you really simplify this complete rental process? And there, there are a lot of some of the, some of the rental players around the world are really just bolt on to the sale portals. So you know the, the real estate dot com use in Australia are a good example of that. Another good player in Japan is called Lifeful, L-I-F-U-L-L. They, they do a very good job in the rental segment because a lot of the, 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 the Japanese market are rentals. People don't buy or sell as much. They just rent. Of course. And for long periods of time. So there are lots of very interesting players out there. And, and all of them have that sort of common attribute of innovation, strong leadership, moving towards the transaction model, right? How do I... How do I how how do I make sure that every month the tenant puts the rental check into my bank account, and I pay the landlord out of it? Mm-hmm. How do I bolt on services? How do I you know put an app in the hand of the renter? So whenever there's a problem in the house, he goes, "Oh, the electricity is not working." Press a button; it comes via me. I outsource it to an electrician that will do the job to a you know on time to spec. I make a margin the way through, mm-hmm. which is always about service, right? And making sure the service is is meets whatever expectations are being set in that process. And that's what I think the, the, the innovating ones are doing around the world. It makes sense. Yeah. Now, I know I asked you this question in our prep call, and I kind of wanted to ask you again, but do you think there's an opportunity for long-term listing sites or historically long-term listing st- sites to compete with short-term listing sites like Airbnb? And how do you envision this from like a revenue model, if you, if you could share something along those lines, if you think that there is an opportunity here? Okay, so, so the answer to the question is there is always an opportunity, but it comes down to how you execute against it. And it's going to be a market by market question. 
So at the end of the day, if I'm, can I really compete with hotels? No, because they've got their own booking engines and it's, it's a very unique, someone's you know, renting the room for a night in reality, right? Right. Airbnb, mm-hmm. you know, two weeks, three weeks, you know, maybe they get towards that midterm rentals, absolutely. And there are a lot of players out there who are saying, how do I get into that segment? The requirements are different to the longer term rental because, you know, there's no, they, they have to be furnished if it's two months. No one's going to furnish a place for two of months. Course. So how do you make that a seamless process? So there is a possibility. I think it's easier for the big guys who are doing long term to come down to short term than it is for the short term guys to go up to the long term. Okay, and and that's because when you go from long term, you're dealing with yeah, it's it's contracted work. It's you know, I'm signing a contract for a year. Well, I can sign a contract for two months. You're taking a deposit. Well, I can take a deposit for three months, two months, one month. So it's so a lot of the basics are the same. You have all the systems already in place for those the things. System, yeah. So it's not. You don't have to build up. You can just build down almost yeah. from yes. that, that already yeah. pro- that process. And the question is then what's the model you adopt? Because one model is you're just a, a, a middleman, right? And you're just trying to, to, to rent out for – now, if it's long-term, you're always going to be a middleman because you're never going to take on responsibility for a lease, right? You're renting out for two months and, and, and that's done and you're just going to be the guy who services the landlord services the tenant and making sure that everything runs smoothly and you'll hopefully take your eight percent of the rent per month or whatever it is as a as um commission and do and make a good margin on it as you get to the two month three month four month it has to be furnished and then the question is well the problem in a year and let's say i, I yeah it's very hard to fill the fill it 100 percent. i might get a two month two month four month three months i've got a month left right i don't know what to do Right? Exactly. And so you've got this issue about yield management. So the prices are always higher for the shorter rentals because you've got the yield management issue. Exactly. Then the challenge is, well, do is that the landlord's problem or is it my problem? So some people take it on themselves and they rent the place on a long-term lease for two years, three years, four years, and then they are, they're playing the, 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 what's it, Jenga, right, or whatever. No, the things that the, the blocks that come down and trying to twist them. Yeah, Jenga, yeah. Jenga, right, until, until so they fill – the, the the calendar perfectly. That's the challenge, right. right? Or Tetris? Is that what you're talking about? Tetris. Tetris. Tetris that's right. That's right. <laughs> there you go. Okay. I'm still stuck in Frogger from way way long ago. <laughs> so that's the that's the game. Who takes the risk in that? Now the landlord doesn't want to have it unrented, and the portal sometimes takes to get the rent at a low rate. So they go and say, well, it's not a hundred dollars. It's going to be eighty dollars. I guarantee you rental. And then they're trying to rent it out for 120, 130 furnished etc but then their problem is you know if they then they might be running at an 85 percent utilization rate so then you do the maths it's so so they're just really the nuances and the challenges in this whole model so as you come from the big big is easy and it comes more complex as you go down through the process that makes sense like i said i because i have an airbnb and i had someone come to me and say i'd like to rent your place for four months And what that meant for me was having to block off the entire four months on my calendar so that nobody rented it or else I'd have someone coming in while someone was already there and that I don't want that to happen. But then after two months, that person found long-term accommodations. And so then I was now two months blocked out of my calendar. And now all of a sudden I had to open up dates but then that person, you know, now I'm I'm kind of hoping that people will come in and rent during that time. Luckily, luckily it happened, but in every scenario is going to be different depending on their location and everything. And and you could be kind of screwed up out of two months of rent if you're operating on trying to do a long-term rental scenario in a short-term rental platform application because it just doesn't, it's not suitable for really that environment because you're operating on the fact that people are coming short-term and the the platform just expects you to do that. And there's a lot of other things with fees related to long-term rentals as well with with kind of an Airbnb where, where a long-term rental platform probably doesn't take as much of those fees out. So you're at the end of the day, you're not losing $300 out of your rental rate a month when you're using a listing site that's for traditionally long-term rental listings. So there's a lot of things there, you know, and it and it's also, you know, a question for Airbnb to kind of improve what they're doing over there because long-term rentals 
are very popular for vacation rental properties. Uh, People like to, now with remote work, go to and stay at vacation rentals for a long term. Uh, They're not just doing two to three days. They're staying for a month, two months, three months. So it's definitely something the industry needs to kind of think about for sure. Now, I I do want to say I have a couple more questions, but as we see, obviously, leading into the remote idea, as more remote transactions are being made, leasing site on scene, how do you see listing sites becoming more efficient for that? For instance, making the leasing process more efficient, attractive, the things that they're, that you've seen or you'd like to see listing sites doing to make that, like you said as well, more transactional, but um, maybe just the information, the quality of content, et cetera, um, that's being posted and, and allowed to be included on listing sites. Yep. So it all comes down to trust at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. All, these, all these businesses are about trust. You buy from Amazon because they say they're going to deliver in two days and, and you know, nine times out of 10, they deliver. Probably 99 times out of, I don't know, right? They deliver in two days. Yeah, absolutely. It's simple. So, so the first is trust. The second is simplicity. You know, you, you use an Amazon because it is easy. One click. You find your thing, it's a well presented and, and it just is easy. So so for, for sites to be successful, they've got to be trusted, which means they've got to build a brand. That's And the brand's got to stand for, if you rent through me, you're um, safe. If you lease your property through me, you'll have, you're safe. You're going to have a great tenant. Who's going to pay? And, and, and so the, 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 the underlying value proposition holds up. If you don't have that, who cares how technologically wonderful you are? No one's going to use you, right? Sure. Okay. Sure. So, so then, then you go to the next step. Once you've built the brand around, you can trust me. Then it's about saying, what are the, what's the process, and how do I make that so simple that it's like a five-point checklist on an iPhone, right? Bang, 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 and I, and it's just, oh, it just takes me through the process. I don't have to really think. Okay. Oh, I build my tenants form once, and it's kept. It does its credit check and comes back with my credit score of whatever it is. Okay. Everything is done. It's simple. So I can reuse that a hundred times, 200 times, 300 times. If I'm making right. multiple applications, then the process has got to be efficient, right? So how do you make that process super efficient so that there's an equivalent app for, for, you know, there should be an app to rent a place, an app for a landlord and an app for once you're using the place or maybe it's part of the first one, right? So if I've got a problem, oh, the plumbing is not working. Click. Oh, it's all fixed. I don't have to worry that right. you know, the plumber will be here at five o'clock in the evening. Bang, bang on the door, five o'clock, the plumber turns up. So, so if you can build that infrastructure, which therefore goes back to the underlying brand, you end up with, I think, a great outcome. Okay? And that's what it is. Right. It's just about put yourselves in the shoes. And often I don't think leaders or businesses do this very well, is really putting themselves in the shoes of their customers. They think they do, but how often is it that they go and rent a property? The answer is very rarely. I mean, I, I, had to, I had to rent one for my son. They're in the business of buying and, and, and renting themselves. They don't need to rent. You know, they, exactly. they're not in that. They're not in the position to rent. Yeah. So in, until, until you've been through the pain as either a renter or as a landlord, I'm a renter at the moment because my son is at college and is renting a place. Sure. Sure. Okay. And so I've been through that pain and it was a painful process. Right? It was not easy. Right. And we, it was sight unseen, but we really had no idea what he was getting. And I didn't really care. Anyway, it was not me. Right? Okay. <laughs> at that, at that point, it doesn't. Yeah. Right, right. Right. And, and, and then I've got a, I've got a couple of properties I rent and i and as you've experienced, right, it can be a painful process as a renter. And then the problem is being the landlord is, oh, the, you, know, you get the call, the electricity is not working. The pump is not working. Something's not working. Right. And you've got to somehow fix it. And you may not even be near the property. Of course. So what do you do? And I think if you can make that whole process super easy, super simple, that people just go, oh, working with company X is a breeze. You've got to rent through them. Of course. Right? And so unless they're buying, they're renting. And I've got a feeling over the, over the next little while, people will be renting at a far greater rate than buying. If interest rates are going up, you've got inflation going up, salaries aren't going to go up at the same rate. So they'll be renting. That is when I think you will have, if you can execute well, you will... I think build a fantastic site. Absolutely, fantastic experience. On the the site is just part of the experience. Yeah, and I think that that's that's the key here is that they should be building more experiences. And I don't think that that's necessarily something they haven't thought of. I think that it just needs to be more developed. 
I think that there's a lot of innovation available that maybe just needs to be integrated. Yep. Looking at the right people who are making those moves, like I, I, I talked to a large investor a, f- a few um, a few episodes ago, and a really smart idea that one of the companies he had invested in was rewards for renters. So if they do things like pay their rent on time, do some maintenance around the around their apartment, they get a reward every single time that they do that, which really makes the rental experience a a lot stickier. They want to stay. They know that they're getting those rewards. They're not going to get them anywhere else if they rent elsewhere. And having that, you know, technology integrated into the experiences is is super valuable. So just looking at those opportunities and seeing where it could fit is, is going to make, you know, these businesses really either flounder and go into, you know, the Craigslist of the world or, you know, really progress. Yep. So my second last question, it's not a, about rental listing sites, but well, it is a bit, but more about who we should have on this podcast that you feel is someone that we would learn or could learn a lot from in the online marketplace for rental listings. So I think I would I would talk to the CEO of Kinto and Da, Gabrielle, I think, mm-hmm. would be very good. I'll talk to some of these startups like Murado Uno, Murado Uno mm-hmm. out of uh, Mexico, which I've mentioned before. There's another one that's coming up in um, Southeast Asia. I think it's Singapore, whose name slipped my mind. I'll, I'll, I'll dig it that's up. That's all right. Here. Yeah, I'll add it to the show notes. Yeah, the, the reason I would talk to these guys is because getting experiences from other countries and applying them to your country is super important because at the core of it, it's the same. There's someone who wants to rent something, okay? Now, how they do it and the requirements and there's guarantors, there's a whole bunch of technicalities that will be different by country, but the underlying core is the same, okay? So what can you learn from these fast growing business? I mean, mean, Kinto and Dara is a unicorn, so it's worth billions, okay? They're they're, Mm -hmm. they're, they're very, very good operators. Just learning and listening for for what they're they're doing and, and, and how you can apply those lessons to your own business. I think is the absolutely the sort of people that you, you you know they should be listening to. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, at last but not least, Simon, if listeners are looking to connect with you or even maybe attend your conference, where can they find you? Because I know that that's coming up soon as well. Yes. So a quick plug: we we are running what's called the Global Online Marketplaces Summit in Miami from the eighth to tenth of June. If you'd like to find out more information, go to www.gomsummit, G-O-M, summit.com. Mm-hmm. Global, it stands for Global Online Marketplaces Summit. Or just send me an email at SB, so that's S for Simon, B for Baker, at C-A-V-I-G.com, C-A-V-I-G.com. Perfect. And, I'm, and, and, I, and I respond to everyone. I do respond to everyone. Part of what I'm passionate about is just sharing the information I've learned over over the last 20 plus years and and just helping people because to, it's the industry will only get stronger if people share information. And the, the, part of the reason we run this conference, by the way, we get, and just, just to quickly about the conference, because I think it is very, Absolutely. very relevant. Yeah. We, we have 250 C-level leaders from everything from like the OLXs of the world, Mercado Libre and so on, right through to startups. And they're, so far we've got about, 15, 18 different countries signed up. So they come from around the world. They come into Miami for three days at sort of a half day, full day, half day. And all we do is look at real issues faced by, and it's the, C, it's the, the CEOs who are presenting, right? There's no fluff. It's no rah-rah. It's, it's meat and potatoes. These are the real issues. Mm-hmm. You can go chat to them afterwards. You can ask questions during the sessions. The whole objective is to share information. This is the 35th or 36th one we've done. We do three a year. One in uh, Miami, one in Madrid at the end of October. If you want to come, we'll have about 500 people to that one. And one in uh, Bangkok, which we'll do next year, COVID willing, in uh, February. Very cool. Yeah, we, we just love to share the information. Yeah, I know I know our founder wants to attend the one in Miami, but I think the one in Madrid and Bangkok also sound very attractive as well. So any excuse 
<laughs> to use those air miles and get somewhere, <laughs> then yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. And I know, uh, actually, I noticed that one of the one of our Canadian marketplaces, um, REW, is attending the one in yes. Miami as well as sponsoring. So yeah. that's that's very cool. I, I believe they're one of our partners as well. So yes, that's awesome. So Simon, thank you so much for meeting with me for a second time and, and for sharing all of your knowledge and taking the time to join me on this episode of Sink or Swim. You know, until next time, keep swimming. You've reached the end of another episode of Sink or Swim. Make sure to visit us at rensink.com forward slash podcast to access show notes, key takeaways, and where you can sign up to our newsletter to receive free bonus content. If you found value in the show, please also remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Thanks for listening.